Robert Armstrong had walked just over two miles, as far as he could judge, when his torch failed. He stood still for a moment, unable to believe that such a misfortune could really have befallen him. Then, half maddened with rage, he hurled the useless instrument away. It landed somewhere in the darkness, disturbing the silence of this little world. A metallic echo came ringing back from the low hills. Then all was quiet again. This, thought Armstrong, was the ultimate misfortune. Nothing more could happen to him now. He was even able to laugh bitterly at his luck and resolved never again to imagine that the fickle goddess had ever favoured him. Who would have believed that the only tractor at Camp 4 would have broken down when he was just setting off for Port Sanderson? He recalled the frenzied repair work, the relief when the second start had been made, and the final debacle when the caterpillar track had jammed. It was no use then regretting the lateness of his departure, he could not have foreseen these accidents, and it was still a good four hours before the Canopus took off. He had to catch her, whatever happened. No other ship would be touching at this world for another month. Apart from the urgency of his business, four more weeks on this out-of-the-way planet were unthinkable. There had only been one thing to do. It was lucky that Port Sanderson was little more than six miles from the camp, not a great distance, even on foot. He had to leave all his equipment behind, but it could follow in the next ship, and he could manage without it. The road was poor, merely stamped out of the rock by one of the board's hundred-ton crushers, but there was no fear of going astray. Even now he was in no real danger, though he might well be too late to catch the ship. Progress would be slow, for he dare not risk losing the road in this region of canyons and enigmatic tunnels that had never been explored. It was, of course, pitch dark. Here at the edge of the galaxy, the stars were so few and scattered that their light was negligible. The strange crimson sun of this lonely world would not rise for many hours, and although five of the little moons were in the sky, they could barely be seen by the unaided eye. Not one of them could even cast a shadow. Armstrong was not the man to bewail his luck for long. He began to walk slowly along the road, feeling its texture with his feet. It was, he knew, fairly straight except where it wound through Carver's Pass. He wished he had a stick or something to probe the way before him, but he would have to rely for guidance on the feel of the ground. It was terribly slow at first, until he gained confidence. He had never known how difficult it was to walk in a straight line, although the feeble stars gave him his bearings. Again and again he found himself stumbling among the virgin rocks at the edge of the crude roadway. He was travelling in long zigzags that took him to alternate sides of the road. He would then stub his toes against the bare rock and grope his way back onto the hard-packed surface once again. Presently, it settled down to a routine. It was impossible to estimate his speed. He could only struggle along and hope for the best. There were four miles to go. Four miles and as many hours. Should be easy enough unless he lost his way, but he dared not think of that. Once he had mastered the technique, he could afford the luxury of thought. He could not pretend that he was enjoying the experience, but he had been in much worse positions before. As long as he remained on the road, he was perfectly safe. He had been hoping that as his eyes became adapted to the starlight, he would be able to see the way, but he now knew that the whole journey would be blind. The discovery gave him a vivid sense of his remoteness from the heart of the galaxy. On a night as clear as this, the skies of almost any other planet would have been blazing with stars. But here, at this outpost of the universe, 
the sky held perhaps a hundred faintly gleaming points of light as useless as the five ridiculous moons on which no one had ever bothered to land. A slight change in the road interrupted his thoughts. Was there a curve here? Or had he veered off to the right again? He moved very slowly along the invisible and ill-defined border, yet there was no mistake, the road was bending to the left. He tried to remember its appearance in the daytime, but he had only seen it once before. Did this mean he was nearing the pass? He hoped so, but the journey would then be half completed. He peered ahead into the blackness, but the ragged line of the horizon told him nothing. Presently he found that the road had straightened itself again and his spirit sank. The entrance to the pass must still be some way ahead. There were at least four miles to go. Four miles! How ridiculous the distance seemed! How long would it take the Canopus to travel four miles? He doubted if man could measure so short an interval of time. And how many trillions of miles had he, Robert Armstrong, travelled in his life? Must have reached a staggering total by now. For in the last twenty years, he had scarcely stayed more than a month at a time on any single world. This very year, he had twice made the crossing of the galaxy. And that was a notable journey, even in these days of the Phantom Drive. He tripped over a loose stone, and the jolt brought him back to reality. It was no use here thinking of ships that could eat up the light years. He was facing nature, with no weapons but his own strength and skill. It was strange that it took him so long to identify the real cause of his uneasiness. The last four weeks had been very full and the rush of his departure, coupled with the annoyance and anxiety caused by the tractor's breakdowns, had driven everything else from his mind. Moreover, he had always prided himself on his hard-headedness and lack of imagination, until now he had forgotten all about that first evening at the base, when the crews had regaled him with the usual tall yarns concocted for the benefit of newcomers. It was then that the old base clerk had told the story of his walk by night from Port Sanderson to the camp and of what had trailed him through Carver's Pass, keeping always beyond the limit of his torchlight. Armstrong, who had heard such tales on a score of worlds, had paid it little attention at the time. This planet, after all, was known to be uninhabited. But logic could not dispose of the matter as easily as that. Suppose, after all, there was some truth in the old man's fantastic tale. It was not a pleasant thought, and Armstrong did not intend to brood upon it, but he knew that if he dismissed it out of hand, it would continue to prey on his mind. The only way to conquer imaginary fears was to face them boldly. He would have to do that now. His strongest argument was that the complete barrenness of this world and its utter desolation, though against that one could set many counter-arguments, as indeed the old clerk had done. Man had only lived on this planet for twenty years, and much of it was still unexplored. No one could deny that the tunnels out in the wasteland were rather puzzling, but everyone believed them to be volcanic vents. Though, of course, Life often crept into such places. With a shudder, he remembered the giant polyps that had snared the first explorers of Vargon III. It was all very inconclusive. Suppose, for the sake of argument, one granted the existence of life here. What of that? The vast majority of life forms in the universe were completely different to man. Some, of course, like the gas beings of Alcaran or the roving wave lattices of Chandeloon, could not even detect him, but passed through or around him as if he did not exist. Others were merely inquisitive, 
some embarrassingly friendly, there were few indeed that would attack, unless provoked. Nevertheless, it was a grim picture that the old store's clerk had painted. Back in the warm, well-lighted smoking room with the drinks going round, it had been easy enough to laugh at it. But here in the darkness, miles from any human settlement, it was very different. It was almost a relief when he stumbled off the road again and had to grope with his hands until he found it once more. This seemed a very rough patch, and the road was scarcely distinguishable from the rocks around. In a few minutes, however, he was safely on the way again. It was unpleasant to see how quickly his thoughts returned to the same disquieting subject. Clearly it was worrying him more than he cared to admit. He drew consolation from one fact. It had been quite obvious that no one at the base had believed the old fellow's story. Their questions and banter had proved that. At the time, he had laughed as loudly as any of them. After all, what was the evidence? A dim shape, just seen in the darkness, that might well have been an oddly formed rock. And the curious clicking noise that had so impressed the old man, anyone could imagine such sounds at night if they were sufficiently overwrought. If it had been hostile, why hadn't the creature come any closer? Because it was afraid of my light, the old chap had said. Well, that was plausible enough. It would explain why nothing had ever been seen in daylight. Such a creature might live underground, only emerging at night. Damn it, why was he taking the old idiot's raving so seriously? Armstrong got control of his thoughts again. If he went on this way, he told himself angrily, he would soon be seeing and hearing a whole menagerie of monsters. There was, of course, one factor that disposed of the ridiculous story at once. It was really very simple. He felt sorry he hadn't thought of it before. What would such a creature live on? There was not even a trace of vegetation on the whole of the planet. He laughed to think that the bogey could be disposed of so easily, and in the same instant felt annoyed with himself for not laughing aloud. If he was so sure of his reasoning, why not whistle, or sing, or do anything to keep up his spirits? He put the question fairly to himself as a test of his manhood. Half ashamed, he had to admit that he was still afraid. Afraid because there might be something in it after all. But at least his analysis had done him some good. It would have been better if he had left it there and remained half convinced by his argument, but a part of his mind was still trying to break down his careful reasoning. It succeeded only too well. And when he remembered the plant beings of Xantel Major, the shot was so unpleasant that he stopped dead in his tracks. Now the plant beings of Xantel were not in any way horrible, they were in fact extremely beautiful creatures, but what made them appear so distressing was the knowledge that they could live for indefinite periods with no food whatsoever. All the energy that they needed for their strange lives they extracted from cosmic radiation, and that was almost as intense here as anywhere else in the universe. He had scarcely thought of one example before others crowded into his mind and he remembered the life form on Tranta Beta, which was the only known one capable of directly utilising atomic energy. That too had lived on an utterly barren world, very much like this. Armstrong's mind was rapidly splitting into two distinct portions, each trying to convince the other and neither wholly succeeding. He did not realise how far his morale had gone until he found himself holding his breath lest it conceal any sound from the darkness about him. Angrily, he cleared his mind of the rubbish that had been gathering there and turned once more to the immediate problem. There was no doubt that the road was slowly rising, 
and the silhouette of the horizon seemed much higher in the sky. The road began to twist, and suddenly he was aware of great rocks on either side of him. Soon only a narrow ribbon of sky was still visible, and the darkness became, if possible, even more intense. Somehow he felt safer with the rock walls surrounding him. It meant that he was protected, except in only two directions. Also, the road had been levelled more carefully, and it was easier to keep it. Best of all, he knew now that the journey was more than half completed. For a moment his spirits began to rise. Then, with maddening perversity, his mind went back to the old grooves again. He remembered that it was on the far side of Carver's Pass that the old clerk's adventure had taken place, if it had ever happened at all. In half a mile he would be out in the open again, out of the protection of these sheltering rocks. The thought seemed doubly horrible now, and he already felt a sense of nakedness. He could be attacked from any direction, and he would be utterly helpless. Until now, he had still retained some self-control. Very resolutely, he had kept his mind away from the one fact that gave some colour to the old man's tale. The single piece of evidence that had stopped the banter in the crowded room back at the camp and brought a sudden hush upon the company. Now, as Armstrong's will weakened, he recalled again the words that had struck a momentary chill even in the warm comfort of the base building. The little clerk had been very insistent on one point. He had never heard any sound of pursuit from the dim shape sensed, rather than seen at the limit of his light. There was no scuffling of claws or hooves on rock, not even the clatter of displaced stones. It was as if, so the old man had declared in that solemn manner, as if the thing that was following could see perfectly in the darkness and had many small legs or pads so it could move swiftly and easily over the rock, like a giant caterpillar or one of the carpet things of Kralkar too. Yet, although there had been no noise of pursuit, there had been one sound that the old man had caught several times. It was so unusual that its very strangeness made it doubly ominous. It was a faint, but horribly persistent, clicking. The old fellow who had been able to describe it, very vividly, much too vividly for Armstrong's liking now. You ever listen to a large insect crunching its prey, he said. Well, it was just like that. I imagine that a crab makes exactly the same noise with its claws when it clashes them together. It was a, what's the word, a chitinous sound. At this point, Armstrong remembered laughing loudly. Strange how it was all coming back to him now. But no one else had laughed though they had been quick to do so earlier. Sensing the change of tone, he had sobered at once and asked the old man to continue his story. How he wished now that he had stifled his curiosity. It had been quickly told. The next day, a party of sceptical technicians had gone into the no-man's land beyond Carver's Pass. They were not sceptical enough to leave their guns behind but they had no cause to use them, for they found no trace of any living thing. There were the inevitable pits and tunnels, glistening holes down which the light of the torches rebounded endlessly until it was lost in the distance, but the planet was riddled with them. Though the party found no sign of life, it discovered one thing it did not like at all. Out in the barren and unexplored land beyond the pass, they had come upon 
an even larger tunnel than the rest. Near the mouth of that tunnel was a massive rock, half embedded in the ground. And the sides of that rock had been worn away as if it had been used as an enormous whetstone. No less than five of those present had seen this disturbing rock. None of them could explain it satisfactorily as a natural formation, but they still refused to accept the old man's story. Armstrong had asked them if they had ever put it to the test. There had been an uncomfortable silence. Then big Andrew Hargreaves had said, Well, how who'd walk out to the pass at night just for fun? And had left it at that. Indeed, there was no other record of anyone walking from Port Sanderson to the camp by night, or for that matter, by day. During the hours of light, no unprotected human being could live in the open beneath the rays of the enormous lurid sun that seemed to fill half the sky. And no one would walk six miles wearing radiation armour if the tractor was available. Armstrong felt he was leaving the pass. The rocks on either side were falling away and the road was no longer as firm and well packed as it had been. He was coming out into the open plain once more and somewhere, not far away in the darkness, was that enigmatic pillar that might have been used for sharpening monstrous fangs or claws. It was not a reassuring thought but he could not get it out of his mind. Feeling distinctly worried now, Armstrong had made great effort to pull himself together. He would try to be rational again. He would think of business, the work he had done at the camp, anything but this infernal place. For a while he succeeded quite well, but presently, with a maddening persistence, every train of thought came back to the same point. He could not get out of his mind the picture of that inexplicable rock and its appalling possibilities. Over and over again, he found himself wondering how far away it was, whether he had already passed it, and whether it was on his right or his left. The ground was quite flat again, and the road drove on straight as an arrow. There was one gleam of consolation, Port Sanderson could not be much more than two miles away. Armstrong had no idea how long he had been on the road. Unfortunately, his watch was not illuminated, and he could only guess at the passage of time. With any luck, the Canopus should not take off for another two hours at least, but he could not be sure. And now another fear began to enter his mind. The dread that he might see a vast constellation of lights rising swiftly into the sky ahead, and know that all of this agony of mind had been in vain. He was not zigzagging so badly now, and seemed to be able to anticipate the edge of the road before stumbling off it. It was probable, he cheered himself by thinking, that he was travelling almost as fast as if he had a light. If all went well, he might be nearing Port Sanderson in 30 minutes, a ridiculously small space of time. How he would laugh at his fears when he strolled into his already reserved stateroom in the Canopus and felt that peculiar quiver as the phantom drive hurled the great ship far out of this system, back to the clustered star clouds near the centre of the galaxy, back towards Earth itself which he had not seen for so many years. One day he told himself he really must visit Earth again. All his life he had been making the promise, but always there had been the same answer. Lack of time. Strange, wasn't it, that such a tiny planet could have played so enormous a part in the development of the universe, should even have come to dominate worlds far wiser and more intelligent than itself. Armstrong's thoughts were harmless again, and he felt calmer. The knowledge that he was nearing Port Sanderson was immensely reassuring, and he deliberately kept his mind on familiar, unimportant matters. 
Carver's past was already far behind, and with it that thing he no longer intended to recall. One day, if he ever returned to this world, he would visit the past in the daytime and laugh at his fears. In twenty minutes now, they would have joined the nightmares of his childhood. It was almost a shock than one of the most pleasant he had ever known when he saw the lights of Port Sanderson come up over the horizon. The curvature of this little world was very deceptive. It did not seem right that a planet with a gravity almost as great as Earth's should have a horizon so close at hand. One day someone would have to discover what lay at this world's core to give it so great a density. Perhaps the many tunnels would help. It was an unfortunate turn of thought, but the nearness of his goal had robbed it of terror now. Indeed, the thought that he might really be in danger seemed to give his adventure a certain piquancy and heightened interest. Nothing could happen to him now, with ten minutes to go and the lights of the port already in sight. A few minutes later, his feelings changed abruptly when he came to the sudden bend in the road. Had he forgotten the chasm that caused his detour and added half a mile to the journey? Well, what of it, he thought stubbornly, an extra half mile would make no difference now. Another ten minutes at the most. It was very disappointing when the lights of the city vanished. Armstrong had not remembered the hill which the road was skirting. Perhaps it was only a low ridge, scarcely noticeable in the daytime, but by hiding the lights of the port, it had taken away his chief talisman and left him again at the mercy of his fears. Very unreasonably, his intelligence told him, he began to think how horrible it would be if anything happened now, so near the end of his journey. He kept the worst of his fears at bay for a while hoping desperately that the lights of the city would soon reappear. But as the minutes dragged on, he realised that the ridge must be longer than he imagined. He tried to cheer himself by the thought that the city would be all the nearer when he saw it again. But somehow logic seemed to have failed him now. For presently he found himself doing something he had not stooped to, even out in the waste by Carver's Pass. He stopped, turned slowly round, and with bated breath listened until his lungs were nearly bursting. The silence was uncanny considering how near he must be to the port. There was certainly no sound from behind him. Of course, there wouldn't be, he told himself angrily, but he was immensely relieved. The thought of that faint and insistent clicking had been haunting him for the last hour. So friendly and familiar was the noise that did reach him at last that the anticlimax almost made him laugh aloud. Drifting through the still air from a source clearly not more than a mile away came the sound of a landing field tractor. Perhaps one of the machines loading the Canopus itself. In a matter of seconds, thought Armstrong, he would be around this ridge with the port only a few hundred yards ahead, the journey was nearly ended. In a few moments, this evil plane would be no more than a fading nightmare. It seemed terribly unfair. So little time, such a small fraction of a human life, was all he needed now. But the gods have always been unfair to man, and now they were enjoying their little jest. For there could be no mistaking the rattle 
of monstrous claws in the darkness ahead of him.